everyone. My name is Kelsey. And I'm Dana. And for our Eleanor Clark Slago lecture, we chose Becoming Innovators in an Era of Hyperchange. Here's our outline. So we're just going to go over our introduction. We're going to start off with a fable called The Three Fish in a Pond. We're also going to discuss what is hyperchange, OT and hyperchange, four conditions that characterize hyperchange, look at the challenge of hyperchange, how to become innovators, three areas in OT that need innovation, and then we're gonna end with our conclusion. So to start off, I'm going to read this quote by our author, Hanosa. We are living in a time of rapid and unpredictable change. Advances in knowledge and technology have made our lives more interconnected and complex. New expectations are changing the dynamics of our personal and professional lives. We're speeding up and struggling to hold on to control of our, all our responsibilities, both personally and professionally. And we're living in a time of hyperchange. This quote highlights the article's themes of how hyperchange is occurring and brings up the question of how OT is going to react to the hyperchange as a profession. Although this quote is from 2007, we thought it still remains true in today's world as well as introduces our lecture. Okay, so this is Jim Hinosa. He is the author, like we mentioned before, of this article. Um, we just wanted to give him some credit and point out some other things that he has accomplished. So to look at the first thing, he has been on AOTA and AOTF committees and commissions. He has received many major awards in OT, including this Eleanor Clark Slagle Lecture in 2007. He has co-authored four major texts, the Frames of Reference for Pediatric Occupational Therapy, Evaluation, Texture of Life, and Perspectives on Human Occupation. He has also published more than 150 peer-reviewed publications and has presented his research widely. So I'm going to read this, um, this fable really quickly because we feel like it sets the tone for this author's voice and his stance. So three fish lived in a pond. One was named plan ahead, another was think fast, and the third was called wait and see. One day they heard a fisherman say that he was going to cast his net in their pond the next day. Plan ahead said, I'm swimming down the river tonight. Think fast said, I'm sure I'll come up with a plan. Wait and see said, I just can't think about it now. When the fisherman cast his nets, plan ahead was long gone, but think fast and wait and see were caught. Think fast quickly rolled his belly up and pretended to be dead. Oh, this fish is no good said the fisherman and threw him safely back into the water. But wait and see ended up in the fish market. And so the saying goes, in times of danger, when the net is cast, plan ahead or think fast. And as occupational therapists, we can't afford to simply wait and see. We must both plan ahead and think fast. We must plan with an understanding of hyperchange and its influences on our lives. We must plan to ensure that we maintain our professional competence, and we must plan for an unsure future with a vision of the world we want to live in and work in. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what is hyperchange. Hyperchange is defined as abrupt, erratic, and random change at an accelerating speed. It includes advances in technology, knowledge, and science. It also presents challenges in today's society such as decisions are needing to be made faster, particularly at the professional level. To fully understand hyperchange, we also need to determine where to focus our energies and how to acknowledge our potential. We need to learn when to use our reasoning skills to advance practices and interactions. So just a quick discussion question. Um, now that we are in 2020, do you still believe we're experience hyper experiencing hyper change? Why or why not? We'll give you about 30 seconds um, to kind of think about your answer for this question.
Okay, so our answer to the discussion question was yes, we're still experiencing hyperchange. Um, we wanted to take a look at it since 2007 and give you guys some examples of why we still think that we're experiencing hyperchange. So the first uh, start of this was in 2007, which was when this article was published. And we can see that that was when the first iPhone came out, which obviously has revolutionized our whole world. Um, also looking at Venmo came out in 2009. Um, in 2010, both FaceTime and Instagram came out. Uh, 2011, Zoom came out, which clearly we're using a lot these days, especially with what's going on with uh, COVID-19. Um, another interesting thing is that the first ECG came out um, in 2018, which is through Apple Watch, and this was actually on your wrist. And in 2020, um, the new Apple Watch now can alert people if they have an irregular heart rate and they can even send that data to doctors. Um, in 2020, we also have autonomous driving. So you can see that through Tesla um, and, a, and specifically the Xbox adaptive controller, which came out in 2020. Um, I, we felt that this was really relevant to OT considering that an OT helped create this adaptive controller. Um, it was designed for people with disabilities to help make user input for video games more accessible. So these were just a few things that we thought really demonstrated that we're still experiencing hyperchange. So in relation to OT, um, another instance in which this affects our practice today includes the fact that practitioners are actually requir required to know more of um, OT knowledge and related skills to perform competent therapy services than they did five years ago. Um, and today, beyond reading scholarly articles and attending continuing education workshops, practitioners also need to be aware of what is on the internet and what colleagues are writing on practice-related email groups, as well as what evidence is available supporting their interventions. They also have to be aware of changing policies and advancing technologies. Knowledge as a whole is expanding rapidly. As it expands, some becomes outdated. Professional competence becomes therefore difficult to maintain within this context. Okay, now we're gonna look at four conditions that characterize hyperchange. The first is increasing uncertainty. The second is rapid pace of change um, because change is occurring at exponential rate. For example, the settings we work in are changing and evolving every day. Similar to what we kind of mentioned earlier, we can see how our world is already changing and adapting today with COVID-19. There are new procedures, there are more demands, more expectations, and we're able to use telehealth for most, most settings through Zoom and other online sites. The third is growing ambiguity. Um, it was noted that we experienced this in the workplace when everyday problems seem to become resistant to routine solutions. So the same things that used to work aren't really working anymore. Uh, the fourth and last condition that characterizes hyperchange is increased complexity in the workplace. So we all have more complex responsibilities and live with ever increasing performance expectations. Um, for example, clients and, and employees expect affordable, high quality interventions that often result in immediate outcomes. And by doing this, this creates high stress and pressure on productivity for the occupational therapist. So the challenge for OT um, in this era of hyperchange um, means that we must alter our views and behaviors in order to create a paradigm shift in this current practice. We also um, can become innovators by dealing and adapting to change and considering each document, theory, and intervention paradigm should be considered um, at the same level of importance. We need to challenge our past ways of thinking in order to, uh, in order to grow. We can't simply wait and see. 
Okay, so here is our discussion post, our discussion question that will be in your post. So how do you think we can challenge hyper change as OTs? We're gonna give you guys another 30 seconds to a minute to just kind of reflect, um, jot some notes down that you think, so I'll help you later. Okay, <clears throat> now we're gonna look at how to become innovators. So there are three basic principles. The first is to anticipate hyper change. So we need to anticipate hyper change and accept that the world is erratic but still full of opportunities. Therefore, we need to not just accept one set of rules, which can be challenging when we're out in the real world as future practitioners, but we need to know that there's other areas and other evidence that we need to seek out. Number two, we also need to acknowledge what changes are really taking place. And we can do this by observing, reflecting, and confirming our conclusions with others. In order to meet the new realities of the world, um, we need to adapt our practices and interventions. The third, principle, which is considered the most difficult actually, is to stop ignoring ideas or events that do not fit in our current thinking. So go beyond what we um, think ourselves. So we need to take these principles and combine them with actions, which are listed below. So the first says, um, go beyond narrative style. It was found that OTs were more likely to use the narrative style in evaluations and treatments, examining the social context and client's point of view, which is essential. However, relying only on the narrative blinds us from other options. Therefore, we need to go beyond this narrative style. So we can utilize diagnostic or the procedural style, and this will broaden our views. The second is to discuss and consult with other therapists. So we can confer with others more and try to understand their perceptions. For example, we can communicate with the physical therapist or the speech therapist. We can see their point of view. This will facilitate new alternatives. In the article also noted that talking with others who may not share our views and perceptions of the world will expand our ideas and thus lead to more potential alternatives. Thirdly, we need to reflect. So we need to examine our own beliefs, values, and our biases. We need to examine a situation and then we need to reflect on it in different perspectives. And lastly, we need to challenge our own perspectives. We need to challenge by thinking opposite to what is conventional. Thinking of two opposites simultaneously. So an example is discharging a client. Usually when we think about discharging a client, it's either discharge or to continue therapy. What, we're, what is proposed is what if you consider both at the same time? Then the possibilities can open a whole new range. For example, such like transitioning to a new setting or providing short-term outpatient therapy or home-based intervention or continuing therapy with new priorities. There are three areas in OT that have a need for innovation. Um, organization, education, and practice, we'll, which we will discuss further on the next few slides. First is professional organization. Uh, so we kind of know of these levels already. Um, we know of AOTA, which is our organization at our national level and provides a wide range of activities, lots of um, documents and different um, helpful 
helpful articles and whatnot. Uh, this, our state associations are generally less structured and have more specific goals. And then our local groups um, are supported by members and provide education opportunities. But are these organizations structures effective? Do they really support the needs of our profession and our colleagues? Canosa, the author of our article, argues that they do not. He believes that in this time of hyperchange, uh, we must evolve and change. His reasoning for this is, if you think about it, activities from 10 years ago might not be effective today. And then we must, we must also look at um, what a professional organization exists for, right? They, they exist to support our profession. So now that OTs established resources to define our language, we've articulated a philosophical base and educated society, although we still have more to do on that. Uh, now it's time to change the purpose of our organizations to address more external issues affecting the profession. So the organizations must develop techniques for dealing with the rapid change and the shifting of our priorities. Hinosa believes the organization needs to reorganize in order to support activities that promote the long-term viability of the profession, monitor legislative and reimbursement policies, and advocate with other organizations to support the profession's present and future goals. Okay, so the second area that we're gonna look at is education. <clears throat> So to survive into the future, Hinosa states that OT educational programs must develop clearly defined research agendas and develop timely and relevant curriculums. There will also be an increasing expectation for faculty and students to engage in research or community agendas. So we can even see this um, within our school, how we're doing thesis. Um, the third is OT programs are going to be integrated into the whole university. One way will be to develop working relationships with the faculty and other departments across the university. So increasing the collaboration. Um, for this, we wanted everyone to think about what we could do within Stanbridge if we were more integrated into the whole university, considering that we have OTA, we have PTA, we have a lot of medical disciplines at Stanbridge. So taking this point and um, you know being integrated into the whole university. Uh, number four, the teaching styles will need to be revised to meet students' learning needs and styles. Um, in fact, it was actually noted that 90% of what students learn today will be irrelevant in five years. So one of the examples that we thought was really um, current to us is we got our therapy ed book when we started this program. However, there's already a new version. So the book that we have is already out of date or so taking that into consideration, teaching styles, but also what we learned, you know, through that book, if we started it in the beginning to what we, um, what is relevant today. Furthermore, it was also highlighted that uh, college students in 2007, so a few years ago, um, have spent 10,000 hours playing video games, answered 200,000 emails, watched 20,000 hours of television, seen 500,000 commercials and spent nearly 5,000 hours reading books. This just illustrates that we need to adjust curriculums to teach students how to learn rather than focusing on only skills, procedures, and techniques. The next generation of OT students may think and reason differently because of their life experiences, because of technology, um, and because they live in their highly technological world. We both thought, like, even for our program, how we have used Kahoot through um, 
throughout school to enhance our learning, whereas in the past, cohorts might not have used that. And lastly, OT graduates, to respond to today's practice demands, occupational therapy graduates need to be able to reason and solve problems in a timely, efficient, and cost-effective manner. Educators should explore alternative teaching and learning theories beyond the domain of occupational therapy to develop new curriculums that give students the knowledge and skills to succeed in a rapidly changing world. And then next we will talk about how hyperchange is affecting our current practice. And as Kelsey mentioned earlier, our OT services are really expected to be cost effective and lead to uh, immediate functional outcomes, which is just not um, necessarily achievable. So this leaves therapists under astonishing pressure to increase their productivity, uh, productivity while utilizing fewer resources. In response, occupational therapy practice has become less individualized and more routine. Therapists end up spending less time with their clients and focusing more on specific techniques. So take Jane, for example. This is um, one example that Hinosa wrote about. Um, Jane works at a large metropolitan hospital in a rehabilitation unit. She's expected to treat six or more patients with a wide range of diagnoses each day. Her patients spend an average of two weeks on the unit. She doesn't have time to develop individualized treatments for each client because she feels too overwhelmed with evaluations and discharge summaries. She has to document everything she does. Then we have Sally who is an itinerant therapist working at three different schools. She's frustrated at not having opportunities to talk and work with her colleagues. She feels that administrators are not supporting her collaboration with them because it could take away from treatment time. She believes their only concern is the child's IEP completion. And she feels like her treatment services are being defined by the curriculum and are resulting in her having to treat too many children who need help with handwriting. She thinks that the principals are not concerned about the quality of the intervention. So therapists report spending less actual therapy time with their clients. Their concerns were centered on efficiency over effectiveness. They seem to have mixed feelings about this because while they value client-centered priorities, they, they feel forced to focus primarily on productivity. So to cope, they focus on establishing routine treatment protocols specific to their clients' problems. They deliver what they consider to be the most efficient treatments. But this shift is away from attending to the individual to focusing on only its efficiency. Therapy then becomes about protocols, techniques, and procedures rather than driven by the theory of practice. So providing competent and effective interventions is a challenge for any occupational therapy practitioner given today's rapidly changing service delivery models and treatment environments. Society, the payers, and the consumers are demanding that practitioners describe the specific outcomes of interventions. Innovation is treatment. Mean, innovation in treatment means that all practitioners must now be able to explain a theory that underlies a frame of reference. Just as we expect doctors to tell us what the effects of a medication might be, consumers and payers expect OTs to be able to explain rationales for intervention and what outcomes might result. Innovation also demands that therapists look for new theories and develop new frames of reference or guidelines for intervention. Some might need to be modified based on revised theories and still others with questionable validity may no longer be appropriate to use. New or revised frames of reference or guidelines for interventions must address the needs of clients in today's world. In this time of hyperchange, we must find a way to redefine the word collaboration. We have to recognize the personal commitment it takes to work together. We must also welcome change as a challenge and not a burden. We should embrace innovations, practice flexibility, and take time to reflect.
Now we're going to look at the transition from a student to a practitioner. And these are just a few that we came up with. Um, so because of hyperchange, we need to research techniques used in settings we are interested in pursuing. This can be whether it's technology or new assessments or evaluations. Um, we want to implement the research in Fieldwork 2 placements. We want to become familiar with all tools and assessments at Fieldwork sites, but be aware of new additions, better technology. So even though we learn assessment out of Fieldwork sites, we want to make sure that we know that there might be, you know, changes upcoming or um, new additions. We just always want to make sure that we're staying up to date. And then number four, we want to anticipate hyperchange. So just anticipate that change will occur, um, not get stuck in our old routines. You don't want to be that therapist that takes the student on and not welcome the new additions or the new changes. And then lastly, just like the fish in the fable earlier, uh, planning ahead gives you a leg up. So plan ahead. And in conclusion, um, we must become innovators to meet our responsibilities as therapists and as individuals. So we, I challenge you all to become innovative, reflective practitioners who embrace life in an era of hyperchange. It's time to plan ahead and think fast. Uh, this quote is how um, the author ended his speech and we just thought it was really moving. And that is it. And this is our reference, which is the lecture. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you.